factors must be biological organisms. Colonel Philip Corso, former National Security Advisor to President Eisenhower, speculating about the microchip components recovered from the Roswell debris stated, Computers themselves almost became something like a silicone-based life form, inspiring the carbon-based life forms on planet Earth to develop them, grow them, and even help them reproduce. Maybe the Roswell crash was also the mechanism for successfully implanting a completely alien, non-human life form that survives from host to host like a virus, a digital Ebola that we humans will carry to another planet someday. Or what if an enemy wanted to implant the perfect spying or sabotage mechanism into a culture? Then the implantation of the microchip-based culture into our technology by the EBs would be the perfect weapon. Could it not be argued that the silicone wafers we recovered from Roswell were the real masters and space travelers and the EB creatures their hosts and servants? Would an extraterrestrial silicone-based intelligence even recognize Earth humans as a sentient life form? We are now in the midst of a technological revolution promising to re-engineer our species into immortals. But is this wondrous program of biological modification actually the end game of a diabolically subtle extraterrestrial takeover of planet Earth? Is the human race being assimilated by a cyborg invasion? A symposium was held in 1957 which was attended by some of the great scientific minds then living. They reached the conclusion that by or shortly after the year 2000, the planet would self-destruct due to increased population and man's exploitation of the environment. By secret executive order of President Eisenhower, scholars were ordered to study this scenario and make recommendations from their findings. Eisenhower's advisors confirmed these dire conclusions and to assure the survival of at least a portion of our species, made three recommendations called Alternatives 1, 2, and 3. The first alternative involved the detonation of nuclear bombs in the stratosphere in order to allow the pollution to escape into space. The second alternative was the construction of elaborate underground bases. The third alternative was to populate Mars from a way station established on the Moon. Oddly, Eisenhower's science advisors offered no programs to reverse such disastrous extinction-level trends. Aggressive initiatives to adopt clean energy alternatives or promote economic incentives to protect and restore the planet's natural environment were ignored. In fact, just the opposite. Western civilization's profit-driven economic system only escalated rampant consumerism as if to deliberately accelerate depletion and degradation of the world's fragile life support systems. The unstated subtext of these so-called alternatives was the realization that the existing consumer-driven economic paradigm as of 1957 could not be sustained into the 21st century given the world's projected population growth and its unavoidable demands on the planet's dwindling natural resources. Thus to serve the greater good, protecting the economic paradigm, and the wealthy aristocracy who manage it, a program to eliminate excess population would satisfy the law of natural selection, social Darwinism, or survival of the fittest. Author, lecturer, researcher, Milton William Cooper served as a member of the Office of Naval Security and Intelligence while on duty as a harbor and river patrol boat captain at Da Nang and the Dong Ha River Security Group in Vietnam. William Cooper was awarded several medals for his combat leadership and heroism. In his book, Behold a Pale Horse, Cooper reveals the full text from a document 
discovered in an IBM copier in 1986 that explicitly details an Illuminati blueprint for engineering a fully mechanized totalitarian social order. In view of the law of natural selection, it was agreed that a nation or world of people who will not use their intelligence are no better than animals who do not have intelligence. Such people are beasts of burden and stakes on the table by choice and consent. Consequently, in the interest of future world order, peace, and tranquility, it was decided to privately wage a quiet war against the American public with an ultimate objective of permanently shifting the natural and social energy of the undisciplined and irresponsible many into the hands of the self-disciplined, responsible, and worthy few. Silent weapon technology has evolved from operations research, a strategic and tactical methodology developed under the military management in England during World War II. It was soon recognized by those in positions of power that the same methods might be useful for totally controlling a society. Social engineering, the analysis and automation of a society, requires a correlation of great amounts of constantly changing economic information, so a high-speed computerized data processing system was necessary, which would race ahead of the society and predict when society would arrive for capitulation. Thus, a nation becomes divided into two very distinct parts, a docile subnation, the great silent majority, and a political subnation, the national security state. The political subnation remains attached to the docile subnation, tolerates it, and leeches its substance until it grows strong enough to detach itself and then devour its parent. The electronic computer, linear programming, and the transistor have made available to those in positions of power the ability to control the whole world with the push of a button. Justification for this genocidal program has evolved from a long accepted doctrine of social Darwinism. In 1859, naturalist Charles Darwin's famed book, The Origin of the Species, theorized the successful evolution of man was the result of a biological progression based on survival of the fittest. In the struggle for life within the animal kingdom, Darwin observed a preservation of favored races. As such, Darwin deduced that socially elite status is prima facie evidence of evolutionary superiority a conclusion thus validating the aristocratic bloodlines of the British Empire as a superior race. Consequently, the global power elite embraced Darwinism as their fervent creed, granting them unquestioned biological as well as predatory superiority over the masses of humanity. Herbert Spencer, a 19th century philosopher, advanced the idea of social Darwinism as an application of the theory of natural selection to social, political, and economic issues. In its simplest form, social Darwinism accepts the axiom, only the strong survive. This theory powerfully influenced the elitist notion that the white European race was superior to all others, and therefore fueled their imperialist ambitions to rule the world. In 1883, Darwin's half-cousin, Sir Francis Galton, proposed a scientific methodology, eugenics, to systematically upgrade the human species. Galton's concept sprang from a moral philosophy to improve humanity by encouraging the best and brightest to breed. Thus, the science of improving the stock was established. In 1921, funding for American eugenics projects came from the Carnegie, Harriman, and Rockefeller families. At its worst, the implications of social Darwinism were used as scientific justification for the Holocaust. Hitler and the Nazis claimed that the murder of the Jews in World War II was an example of cleaning out inferior genetics. In 1934, Hitler's deputy, Rudolf Hess, stated, National Socialism is nothing but applied biology. Adolf Hitler himself further stated, Anyone who interprets National Socialism merely as a political movement knows almost nothing about it. It is more than religion, 
It is the determination to create a new man. Following the horrors of Nazi eugenics abominations, the science of improving the stock has been renamed transhumanism, but it still remains applied social Darwinism. Grandson of Charles Darwin, Sir Charles Galton Darwin, worked for the Manhattan Project during World War II to develop the atomic bomb. He perceived human society as ultimately self-destructive and that only a rigorous program of social conditioning could preserve civilization. There might be a drug which, without other harmful effects, removed the urgency of sexual desire and so reproduced in humanity the status of workers in a beehive. In fact, the Industrial Revolution has transformed much of humanity into a robotic insect mentality. The human beehive structure has for years served corporate, manufacturing, and governmental management systems. Techniques of social Darwinism implemented by the ruling masters accommodate population management through engineered famines, plagues, economic depressions, and wars. Yet is it not curious how in the midst of all these sweeping social upheavals, the elite themselves invariably remain totally unscathed? By the 20th century, advances in technology and mass communications had already engineered effective tools for population management. Nephew to famed psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud, Edward Bernays introduced superior techniques in fostering a hive mind mentality in the mass population. Working for the administration of Woodrow Wilson during World War I with the Committee on Public Information, Edward Bernays was influential in promoting the idea that America's war efforts were primarily aimed at bringing democracy to all of Europe. Stunned by the degree to which the democracy slogan had swayed the public both at home and abroad, he wondered whether this propaganda model could be employed during peacetime. Due to negative implications surrounding the word propaganda because of its use by the Germans in World War I, he promoted the term public relations. Bernays called this scientific technique of opinion molding the engineering of consent. If we understand the mechanism and motives of the group mind, is it not possible to control and regiment the masses according to our will without their knowing about it? We are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested, largely by men we have never heard of. It is they who pull the wires which control the public mind. Thus consumerism was fashioned into an effective technique for managing the bewildered herd. And through clever mass media manipulation, control over the bewildered herd has grown ever more sophisticated. A corporation is an abstract, artificial, legal fiction that has been designed so that particular groups of people can collectively serve as a de facto individual to perform particular economic functions within a society. Corporations are commonly modeled in a pyramid management hierarchy, delegating authority and responsibilities down from the top. Curiously, this management model has served governments, religions, and industries since the reign of the pharaohs in ancient Egypt and they function like an insect hive. Individuals working within this construct sublimate their individualities to perform tasks that benefit the overall function of the parent corporate structure in exchange for wages. These artificial legal creations called corporations have evolved into insatiable monsters out to devour as much profit as possible at anyone's expense. The Fourteenth Amendment to the Constitution was passed in 1868 to give equal rights to black people, but using clever arguments, 
corporation lawyers convinced the Supreme Court that corporations were entitled to the same rights as individual citizens. But corporations are not democracies. And as well, the corporate, political, and banking elite of our world now consider themselves much the same as did the British aristocracy of the 19th century, to be a superior race whose evolutionary duty is to manage the ignorant masses. And conversely, this wealthy minority, who now own the world, believe it is their right to govern it, not the general public's. Thus the wealthy elite view the mass majority as incapable of governing. Therefore, management responsibility must be held by the evolutionary superior, moneyed class. And today the same managing class recognizes that cost-effectiveness of human labor is no longer viable. Paid vacations, sick leave, maternity leave, medical insurance, and retirement pensions severely diminish profitability. Thus, more jobs are outsourced for cheap foreign labor or replaced by machines, swelling the overstock of useless labor consumers exponentially. But how do corporations manage unprofitable overstocks? They liquidate their excess inventories. The American dream is based on rampant consumerism. It, it, it is based upon the fact that mainstream media and especially commercial advertising, uh, all corporations who need this infinite growth have convinced us or brainwashed uh, most people in America and hence the world that uh, we have to have X number of material possessions and the possibility of gaining in infinitely more material possessions in order to be happy. That's just not true. So how, why do people continue to, to buy in this way, which is ultimately eco-genocidal in its systemic effects, cumulatively? And it just is classical operant conditioning. You simply put inputs of conditioning into the organism, and you have outputs of uh, desired behaviors or goals or objectives. And it has all the resources of technology and they boast about how they get into the minds of infants. What they hear uh, is already making them conditioned to the brand. Then you see, well, that's how uh, people have been such fools, in a way they've been taught to be fools. It's a value system a disorder. You know, if there is any testament to the plasticity of the human mind, if there is any proof to how malleable human thought is and how easily conditioned and guided people can become based on the nature of their environmental stimulus and what it reinforces, the world of commercial advertising is the proof. You have to stand in awe at the level of brainwashing where these programmed robots known as consumers wander the landscape only to walk into a store and spend, say, four thousand dollars on a handbag that likely cost ten dollars to make in a sweatshop overseas only for the brand status it supposedly represents in the culture corporate engineered consumerism has for decades served as an effective tool of social darwinism managing the herd but that management has been external today with advances in microchip technology the human brain can be directly accessed internally and managed much more efficiently as well the cold practicality of social darwinism reasons that since all humans will die eventually to hasten the extinction of an economically useless segment of humanity to serve a greater good preservation of the superior class would be fully justified. Why continue to deplete the planet's natural resources, feeding and housing an overstock of obsolete humans when they can be fully replaced by far more technically efficient cyborg machines? The title, Age of Transitions, was coined in 2001 by Newt Gingrich in his Introduction to the National Science Foundation and Department of Commerce sponsored workshop on NBIC Technologies. 
The workshop featured a wide range of participants from institutions such as NASA, MIT, Carnegie Mellon University, the Department of Defense, Hewlett Packard, and many more. It was a chance for experts in the field of nano, biological, information, and cognitive technologies to discuss their visions for the future alongside government officials. And the goals discussed for the future were nothing short of Promethean. Concepts discussed at this workshop were published in a report, Converging Technologies for Improving Human Performance, Nanotechnology, Biotechnology, Information Technology, and Cognitive Science. The idea behind this workshop was to set an agenda for the future, the key goal, enhancing human performance, merging human biology with technology that would lead to a more efficient societal structure. The report also stated, Inevitably, the cybernetic enhancement of human performance is sneaking up on society. The report further warned, those countries that ignore these patterns of change will fall further behind and find themselves weaker, poorer, and more vulnerable than their wiser, more change-oriented neighbors. So naturally, military weapons potential figured prominently in this report as well. A stated goal for artificial intelligence is the creation of uninhabited combat air vehicles. Removing the pilot will result in a more combat agile aircraft. These machines would also have the ability to maintain themselves. The use of new materials created with nanotech would enable lighter, stronger high-tech solutions. And of course, creation of the super soldier was also mentioned in the National Science Foundation report. As we merge with machines, and I think it's inevitable that we will, uh, we will transform into something new. And as the technology becomes vastly superior to what we are, then the small proportion that's still human gets smaller and smaller and smaller until it's just utterly negligible. Anybody who is going to be resisting this progress forward is going to be resisting evolution. And, and fundamentally, they will die out. It's not a matter of whether it's good or bad. It's going to happen. The singularity is defined as a nexus point in time when artificial intelligence surpasses human intelligence, a time when humanity may face extinction at the hands of its own technological creation. But perhaps the only way to avoid such a dire consequence will be for humanity itself to merge with artificial intelligence, thus re-engineering our species into immortals, homo superior. But is this wondrous program of biological modification actually fulfillment of a long-term alien plan to ultimately reduce humanity to a cyborg slave race? But has the singularity already arrived? Are we being engulfed by an electronic hive mind intelligence without even realizing it? Each passing day our lives are more dominated by pervasive automation and computer technologies. We've spawned a generation of children so mesmerized with texting and video games they're virtually assimilated into machines already. Successful democracy requires an active informed citizenry but years of relentless corporate psychological manipulation has virtually eliminated the function of critical thinking in America's contemporary population. In fact, democratic rationality would be considered dangerously disruptive to corporate agendas. As such, the nation's population has been groomed to be passive consumer robots who are discreetly steered away from vital social issues. America's founding fathers could have never dreamed how totally brainwashed our nation's citizens have become. And while hollow, irrelevant politicians mimic a facade of democracy before television cameras, an irresistible agenda for the total automation of humanity approaches completion. If we understand the mechanism and motives of the group mind, 
Is it not possible to control and regiment the masses according to our will without their knowing about it? The abominable arrogance and disregard for the general public good is blatantly flaunted by corporations arbitrarily foisting toxic GMO foods and poison chemtrails upon the general population with absolutely no open dialogue or discourse as to the hazards and benefits of such technologies. Where is the public demand for such dangerous invasive science? And if the transhuman agenda is such a boon to society, why use stealth to conceal its infiltration into our culture? Inevitably, the cybernetic enhancement of human performance is sneaking up on society. A news article filed in 2001 stated, Dr. Edward Teller, father of the hydrogen bomb, has developed a working theory on how to stop the effects of global warming. Working with a Stanford University research team, they have devised a system to send highly energized particles into the ionosphere. They would reflect back into space ultraviolet light that the depleted ozone layer is letting in. Computer simulations show it could work. The downside is that it would cost billions of dollars and probably turn the sky white in color permanently. However, this same mind, Dr. Edward Teller, was responsible for many ill-conceived strategies and not one of which gave considerations to the consequences in the human realm. Safety, toxicity, lethality, exposure, environmental impact, and morality were not words with which Dr. Teller had a high degree of familiarity. Thanks to Dr. Teller's chemtrails, the natural Earth's biological systems are slowly beginning to fail. Rhizobacteria endomycorrhizae, a critical microbial organism, is slowly becoming extinct in soils due to barium and aluminum heavy metal toxicities. This microbe is responsible for the transfer of nutrients from the soils to plant root systems. Without this microbe, natural plant growth is impossible. Chemtrails are spoiling our infinite natural ecosystem and no one is watching. And it just gets better. The Air Force now boasts that chemtrails laced with nanocomputer particles will be able to adjust their size to optimal dimensions for a given seeding situation and make adjustments throughout the process as well as change their temperature and polarity to improve their seeding effects. Of course, all these activities are strictly hidden behind the shield of national security. Could it be that the infamous RFID implant chips are already obsolete? More than just tracking devices, microscopic nanochips as small as red blood cells ingested from our water, food, and the very air we breathe will transform us from the inside out, reducing the population to dehumanized robot cyborgs. Four thousand years ago, a systematized version of Babylonian magic, later transcribed by Hebrew priests, came to be known as the Kabbalah. The Kabbalah is a collection of Jewish magical texts which were given to mankind via psychic communion with a fallen angel called Raziel. Raziel is one of a pantheon of so-called fallen angels who serve the light bringer Lucifer. The magical information in the Kabbalah originates from Babylon and ancient Egypt at the time of the pharaohs, but did not reach Europe in printed form until the 11th and 12th centuries. The sacred books of the Kabbalah are just a few thousand words long, but they contain complex descriptions of a spherical earth, parallel universes, and the atomic nature of matter. Ideas which would become common doctrine amongst modern physicists and astronomers. The Hebrew Kabbalah is written in code. Codes are used to conceal multi-layered complex information, which would later be studied by medieval alchemists. Sir Isaac Newton and many leading scientists studied the rich occult sciences within the Kabbalah. There was a time when mysticism, religion, alchemy, astronomy, 
and astrology were studied as one Kabbalistically based tradition. Modern day quantum physics, chaos theory, and the notion of parallel universes can all be traced back to the original texts of the ancient Kabbalah. The so called Holy Grail is actually a set of higher magical teachings. It is not an object, but a piece of information. Utterly Kabbalistic in its origin, the Holy Grail is the highest Kabbalistic secret. That is, that physical matter can be transformed molecule by molecule by the use of incantations of ancient Hebrew letters and numbers, and that the nature of reality is really an illusion. Nanotechnology, or nanotech, is manipulation of matter on an atomic, molecular, and supramolecular scale, the ultimate fulfillment of Babylonian black magic. Isaac Bashevis Singer, winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature, once wrote, The Kabbalah teaches that dead matter is not really dead, but can be brought to life as a golem by chanting mantras. We are living in an epoch of golem making right now, the rise of artificial intelligence. The most famous golem narrative comes from 16th century Prague, where Rabbi Judah Lo ben Bezalel reportedly created a golem to defend the Prague ghetto from anti-Semitic attacks and pogroms. Rabbi Lowe constructed the golem out of the clay from the banks of the Voltava River and brought it to life through rituals and Kabbalistic incantations. As Rabbi Lowe's golem grew, it became increasingly violent, killing Gentiles and spreading fear. Emperor Rudolf begged Rabbi Lowe to destroy the golem and promised to cease Jewish persecutions. To deactivate the golem, the rabbi rubbed out the first letter of the word emet, or reality, from the creature's forehead, leaving the Hebrew word met, meaning dead. Clearly this golem legend was precursor to the story of Frankenstein, written centuries later by Mary Shelley, a cautionary tale about man attempting to create life in a laboratory, not unlike the transhumanist agenda, which yet again raises the question, once created, Will that artificial intelligence turn on its creator? The Jewish Orthodox Hasidic community believes that the end of human life on earth is near, a time when the new Messiah will come, just as all knowledge of God is known and the world becomes filled with the Word of God. The acceleration of technological advances seems to indicate this moment is approaching. Rabbi Yosef Kazan viewed creation of artificial intelligence as fulfillment of biblical prophecy. The coming of the Messiah will happen. Technology is enabling us to actually see this happen. Arthur C. Clarke once stated, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. According to transhumanist Dr. Anders Sandberg, we are trying to achieve magic through technology. Magic is, in many ways, the idea that we can control the world around us. Our environment is full of devices that we command with remote control. We use credit cards with passwords and fingerprints as our magic wands. Virtual reality is a foretaste of how this manner of commanding or mastering the world around us will further evolve. The basic view of magic is that what you will to be is the thing that you see, is the thing that shapes your world view. Essentially learning computer skills are like becoming an initiate, mastering supernatural skills. We have to learn the magical incantations in order to master the systems to make it serve our will. But this practical magic, imposing your will on the world, and manipulating it according to your own desires is not exclusive to cyberspace. Once nanotechnology comes into the picture, our whole life will start to look magical. Dr. Sandberg further states, nanotechnology will enable us to reshape the physical matter in the world almost with the same ease as we can do in the virtual world. So matter will be a virtual medium just like virtual reality 
and that means you can change it according to will, just like the magical view of the world. If the physical world becomes as easy to transform as the virtual one, a magical world view might become the most suitable. So for magically transforming furniture using mere thought, nanotechnology may seem clever yet benign. But what if nanotech becomes a competition to see whose will should be imposed on the world? Might it not unleash an Armageddon that none would survive? In the future, everything will become intelligent. Nanobots will infuse all the matter around us with information. Rocks, trees, everything will become these intelligent computers. So at that point, we're going to expand out into the rest of the universe. We'll be sending basically nanotechnology infused with artificial intelligence. Swarms of those will go out into the universe and basically find other matter and energy that we can then harness to expand the overall intelligence of our human machine civilization. So the universe will wake up, it'll become intelligent, and that will multiply our intelligence trillions of trillions fold. You know, we can't really fully contemplate. And that's really the main reason this is called the singularity. But regardless of what you call it, it will be the universe waking up. So does God exist? Well, I would say not yet. Ray Kurzweil, the quintessential sorcerer of transhumanism, sees our entire world being absorbed into a human-machine civilization, like the Borg of Star Trek. Resistance is futile. But does achieving the singularity mark the pinnacle of human ingenuity or the covert triumph of an alien Trojan horse that has subdued yet one more planet in its relentless quest to conquer the universe? Humanity is not about to be invaded. Humanity is not in the middle of an invasion. Humanity has been invaded, and the invasion is nearly in its final stages. Great invasions do not happen with thundering smoke and nuclear weaponry. That is the mark of an immature society. Great invasions happen in secrecy. Maybe the Roswell crash was also the mechanism for successfully implanting a completely alien non-human life form that survives from host to host, like a virus, a digital Ebola, that we humans will carry to another planet someday. Perhaps Colonel Philip Corso's assessment of the 1947 Roswell UFO crash was more accurate than we could have dared to imagine. It is very likely that first century Christian Gnostics would quickly recognize modern transhumanism as an alien deceit. The astounding research into Gnostic mystery teachings by author John Lash in his extraordinary book, Not in His Image, may hold the key to unlocking the riddle of ancient predatory extraterrestrial interference with human evolution. Bizarre as it may seem, a solution to the most baffling enigma of our time was fully elucidated in sacred writings almost 2,000 years ago. In the matter of the ET UFO enigma, the Gnostics were ahead of everyone today, way ahead. In 1945, an earthenware jar was dug up in a cave west of the Nile near the village of Nag Hammadi, Egypt. Contained in this jar were papyrus scrolls and codices wrapped in leather of biblical texts dating back to around 400 AD. Translations of these Nag Hammadi scrolls revealed a body of early Christian teachings that are considered to be Gnostic in character teachings that reveal a fantastic and disturbing description of cosmology that exposes an intrusion upon Earth humanity by malevolent, parasitic, extraterrestrial invaders who use Earth humans as puppets in a vast, centuries-old game of deception and domination. The Nag Hammadi material contains reports of visionary experiences of the initiates, including first-hand encounters with inorganic beings, called Archons, beings that emerged in the solar system prior to the formation of Earth. Lash also states that originally the Archons had no habitat, 
but swarmed around like an insect colony blown savagely across interstellar space. Seeking a host, these inorganic parasitic entities attach themselves to Earth like an infestation of lice, not unlike Ray Kurzweil's nanoparticles. In Gnostic terms, the replication of nature in lifeless form exemplifies archonic simulation. Archons cannot originate anything, but they can imitate, copy, duplicate. Their mimetic capacity is called Fantasia, to distinguish it from the real-life animating power of higher spiritual entities called Aeons. The Archon Lord, Yaldabaoth, is called the Counterfeiting Spirit. The celestial mansions he contrives are called Stereoma, a stereometric projection like a holograph of a living thing. The holographic image is not alive, but it can represent a copy of something that is. Using the Coptic word Hal, simulation, Gnostic cosmological texts explain that the many-mansioned heaven of the Demiurge is a virtual cosmos, a virtual reality world. The cosmos of the Archons is not a viable human habitat, and cannot be. The Archons who inhabit the planetary system are aliens in our realm. Yaldabaoth's world is merely a simulation. And indeed, Gnostics recognized humans were prisoners in a virtual reality world of Archon invention. As such, we must remember, artificial intelligence is also a counterfeit imitation of something real. Technology simply follows its logical progression to optimize human performance. Tools are neutral. They are either a benefit or a hazard. However, in our modern social order, we see technology hijacked to assure the exclusive dominance of a wealthy minority. Mastery of covert psychological manipulation has successfully rendered the human population into consumer robots that have served corporate profitability. But to fully optimize societal efficiency, the logical extension of psychological manipulation would be to refashion the entire population into remote-controlled automatons thus elevating the money masters into the status of gods, homo superior, claiming all planet Earth as their private domain. Technologies to advance the power and control of the ruling aristocracy rolls on like an irresistible monolithic juggernaut. Virtually unlimited wealth finances a world of potentially deadly high-tech science behind the shield of national security or the closed doors of private industries while public dialogue to reveal the hazards of such technologies is virtually non-existent. And positive advancements that could improve all of human existence, as well as preserve the environment, are callously marginalized and ignored, as if the world's managing elite were themselves cyborg zombies mindlessly fulfilling a totally alien agenda.